I actually think it's a vast overreach by the United States government. I think the government has the ability to know far too much about its citizens, and people should be really upset about that. I really don't think that there is a breadcrumb trail that you can follow where if a government knows more about you, you are actually safer as a people. I think there is a breadcrumb trail where you can follow that the more the government knows about you, probably the less secure that you are. I don't have any wisdom, but I certainly will tell people what I think, regardless of what they may think about it and how it lands with them. And if you don't like the answer, don't ask me the fucking question. Good stuff. Andy Stump, <laughs> ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the show. <laughs> Thank you for having me. Primetime ratings last night. CNN, 569,000. Fox News, 1.73 million. Okay. MSNBC, 1.86 million. The first episode of Tucker Carlson on Twitter, 82 million in 20 hours so far. So basically an ADX increase over what would be considered traditional mainstream media. Yeah, of 40, 30X over all three put Combined. together. Yeah. Wow. Um, where do you get your news from? Mostly the internet. How do you select your source and how do you bounce, you know... We're in an interesting time, a time where I think people have more access to information than in the history of humankind. And it seems like every day we're through that envelope or threshold even more. I have seen it in myself. I've seen it in other people. I'm sure you have too. The pros of the internet is you can find anything you want to. The cons of the internet is you can find anything that you want to. If you go there pre-cocked or with some type of confirmation bias, let me just tell anybody what they're going to find on the internet, exactly what they're looking for. And you can get lost in fake news, literally like satire sites that sometimes are so ridiculously good. They're hard to tell that they're satire. Fucking totally here for it. Um, you'll come on to traditional media outlets like in the Fox News, the CNN. And if and I'm sorry if this day and age if people don't realize that everybody and that message is bought and paid for. I don't know how to help you because it's right there in your face. You'd have to be blind to not see it. And I don't have a problem with people getting news from either one of those sources. Let's just recognize there's a slant on it and a bias. And also they're in the business of selling ads, just like TV. So it leads you at this place. Where do you get information? Do you go on to Substack? Do you go on to Twitter? Do you go on to traditional media outlets? How much do you have to balance it against the other side to determine that the information that you're getting is actually legitimate or real? Did you see the debate between Malcolm Gladwell and Douglas Murray a couple of months ago? No. You know Malcolm the yep. and, and Douglas as well. Yep. And uh, it was a discussion around mainstream media basically needs to, it, it's uh, not something that you should be able to trust. And there were some really interesting arguments from both sides that there are constrictions uh, and guidelines around what you can and can't do with traditional media that are um, unrestricted when it comes to the more new media. Uh, but that also brings with it degrees of freedom that people can take advantage of. It's yep. a really, really interesting discussion. And I think the sort of terminally online world sees new media as this bastion of free speech, which gets itself closer to the truth because it's no longer encumbered by any of the rules and procedures and the bought and paid for and so on. But I think if everybody took a really close look at it, the incentives are different, but they're still not exactly pure. Free speech and truth are not always synonymous. And I think people have to be really cautious with that. I don't have a great answer for myself as to where you even bounce ideas or resources, especially in a world where like I've just recently started playing around with chat GPT, holy shit, or image creators, holy shit. And these are in the, in like what will be viewed in the very near future as their infancy. Yeah. If they're that good right now and it can really fool intelligent people, I feel like Skynet is just around the corner. <laughs> we are mere inches away from just getting butt fucked by robots. That's what it's going to look like. <laughs> Dude, I, I, have a, I have a friend who sells silk pillowcases and bamboo sheets on Amazon. And he has been Amazon funneling and building his business up mm -hmm. and so on and so forth. It's very effortful to do. And he got ChatGPT to write his sales page for him. And then he used MidJourney to create the photos that he needed to do for the image listing and the increase in his sales that he's had is absolutely absurd. 
and he showed me, look, these are the other top five competitors for bamboo sheets and, yeah. and silk pillowcases in the United States. And look at how much better my images are. He said, well, because I wasn't constrained by reality or physics. I was able to just perfectly dial in exactly what I wanted through mid journey. And I got chat GPT to write the prompts for mid journey. Yeah. So you've got AIs telling AIs what to do. So, so I literally, the day before yesterday, this is the 7th of June, I think on the 5th of June, I tried mid journey for the first time because I kept seeing articles about it. And I was thinking, how could I make, I'm like, could I improve YouTube thumbnails for the podcast messing around with this? Because oftentimes, as I'm sure you or your staff knows, I kind of want to have a certain feel. So I'll just Google image search. (laughs) I'm not Google image search shit. I'm going to create it in a day and a half. And I'm going to be super upfront honest. I'm an idiot. I am not an intelligent person. I can like, I can wrecking ball my way through life in a day and a half. I have already created some images that were beyond what I was even thinking was possible. And that's 1.5 days. I mean, with the least experienced user on the planet. Yeah. 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 It's terrifying. Man. So <laughs> I, I think your point when it comes to talking about media, heterodox, new wave, whatever, uh, is that, you're going to be able to propagate a lot more news stories that are going to be automatically generated. Maybe this is th- the bulk of reporting, the boring stuff that just needs to be done potentially will come from chat GPT or some other sort of automated system, which has been trained on the biases that humans have. Yeah. So it perpetuates and propagates those existing biases. So yeah, man, this, this Tucker thing is, is absolutely fascinating, you know, for, I think, uh, Matt Walsh's what is a woman? that the Daily Wire released yep. over the weekend to celebrate the start of Pride Month. That's right. They released it. Uh, Twitter allowed him to put it up. Correct. Then Elon Musk that. retweeted it and pinned it. That is potentially the most viewed documentary in human history now because it got <laughs> hundreds of million, I think a hundred million plays over the weekend. That's insane. On Twitter. The most viewed documentary in human history. I think that's a metric for how much people don't have faith anymore in traditional media sources. I I truly think that it is. My concern is with the AI, whether it's a good thing or bad thing, at some point my thoughts will always shift back to weaponization and the volume of information that that AI can create and could get the snowball rolling downhill before people could actually backtrack and figure it out. Mm -hmm. For most people, it seems like their, their deeply held beliefs are about one click deep. And it's usually the first search result. So if you've got a volume of information heading in the wrong direction, that was legitimately untrue. And I think it's a very uh, fair thing to say that the the Western world, however you would want to define that has, you know, there's an access to every belief system and there's an access to those belief systems. And those belief systems are also looking at AI and leveraging AI and weaponing, weaponizing AI. I don't know if we're intelligent enough as a species to survive. Well, think about it this way, right? You make, content on the internet, as do I. What you're trying to do is find a balance somewhere between exactly what you want to talk about and what your interests are, and some degree of what's going to be at least partially interesting to the audience. You don't want to compromise yourself so much that you get audience captured, but you don't want to be so niche and completely uh, solipsistic that all you do is indulge yourself over and over. It's a blend between the two, right? There is a third participant in every conversation that is the audience member that's listening. What you're trying to do is, in some regard, on varying degrees, reverse engineer what the audience wants, right? That's yeah. the, At least you're, you're conscious of what the audience wants. So creators try to do that, and then algorithms try to deliver content that people want to it. So the creator predicts what the algorithm needs based on what the audience wants. Now, you can remove the creator altogether and just go algorithm direct to consumer, Right. Because you have no restriction on how many different iterations of content and images. You remember the Cambridge Analytica thing, right? Where yes. there was um, custom-built memes around the exact pain point that these particular subgroups had around Hillary Clinton or whoever it was, and we're going to target them and create them and do all of the rest of them. But there's still a guy somewhere sat working out what meme to make, what text to use, dragging the image in, creating it, putting it out there. You could have individual me, right, I know Andy's profile, and we will make a meme or yep. a series of memes just for him. So I think, yeah. But it, wait until the AI can replace that individual, and then you have AI teaching other AI. Correct, correct. And then we have to go beg a robot for our water ration every day. Yeah. 
Well, dude, I think, <laughs> I think it's, it's terrifying. Yeah, it, it is. And when you think that within the space of probably three years, it wouldn't be surprising if most of the content created on the internet is no longer human generated. If you think that the internet is a cesspool at the mm-hmm. moment, at least you know the content that you're consuming was made by another person. Yeah. In the future, it very well might be the case that it's a rarity to not have an automated, oh my God, this is a post from a real person, as opposed to an automated uh, bot of some kind. There's already um, uh, social media where you need to upload images of your face. I think maybe even Instagram has this for verification now uh, to ensure that it's not bots. So you have to put a photo of your face up and maybe a photo of your ID up. And what this does is it ensures not only is it the same person, but if you try and duplicate it, you can't have more than one account or some other some such, which is trying to restrict bot activity. And that's just now. I mean, in one and a half days on mid journey, I feel like I could create both of those things. <laughs> a full universe. Give me a half an hour and I could create both of those things. And then Here's you a have new a person. I mean, what is it? What happens when it gets to the point, if we're not already edging towards it already, where people are questioning every piece of information that comes at them because they don't know? They don't know if it's biased. I think we're already there. I think we're already there too, but I don't know. If, I don't think if we're trending for it to get better. I'm concerned that we're trending for it to get worse. And where does that land us? Where do people go at that point to actually get information about the world that they can trust? Well, you you mentioned at the beginning that the issue that people have is now uh, an abundance, not scarcity. Right? Mm-hmm. There's too much information, not too little information. And very quickly, the over the last sort of 30 years, the skill set that was most advantageous to a human went from someone who is able to seek out information to somebody that is able to discern information, right? It's now all about, can you work out how legitimate this is? Can you do your sources or your checks? Uh, a video from a friend of mine went hyper viral as he was talking about... Um, America is the third highest country out of 193 nations worldwide in gun crime. And if you were to remove the five largest cities for gun crime from that, we would move from third down to 190th or 189th or something like that. Took me one Google search to find out that that's not true. That's not even remotely. Sounds great. It sounds fucking amazing. (laughs) Yeah, like, oh, fuck. Well, let's just cut these cities out of the US. Problem solved. Oh, and there was like a little (laughs) bit of a, 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 they're mostly blue cities and blah, blah, blah. And uh, don't get me wrong, dude. If I'd heard it and I've propagated tons and tons of stuff like that, oh, I heard this like little zinger. Yeah. Let me get it out there. That sounds cool. Uh, but yeah, that's you with your human biases. Imagine if you had a custom purpose built viral machine that knew exactly the way to deliver it, that knew exactly yeah. what was going to trigger your. But going back to the Tucker conversation, right? You, as somebody that's been in this great nation longer than I have, how likely do you think it is? that more and more of the news guys, I think Trevor Noah recently left his show. I think he was released or, or maybe left. Uh, Tucker Carlson obviously released by Fox yeah. and now doing his own thing. What do you think the future of these sorts of news organizations would be? If people can go and make 40 times the entire primetime ratings by going and, and YOLOing it themselves with a couple of students and a nice garage set up in the house, maybe we don't need mainstream media anymore. I think we're through the looking glass on that one. I I think that Tucker and just those numbers alone speak to how much people are looking to a traditional source. And the traditional models, I mean, I think they're mired in bureaucracy. I have uh, been to the Fox um, News studio a few times. I've done a a couple of written pieces for them and a couple of uh, in-person stuff. And it is a large building with a massive amount of people that is constrained. You know, they have... They do have different uh, journalistic uh, thresholds and barriers that they're going to need to at least be able to clear to present uh, information and ideas, but they're way slower and there are 100% soft and probably hard boundaries on what their hosts can say, what they can do. And I'm sure that the money is good. I have no idea what they what they make, but if somebody wants to go out and have complete flexibility and autonomy and probably actually make orders of magnitude, more money by being on their own. Mm. Why would you mire yourself in bureaucracy when you can put together a small team and be, you know, the first person through the door and then reap the benefit of that? Are you on a network? Your show? Uh, no, just the internet. No, but you, you know, what, you know what I mean? Like an iHeart radio. Uh, no, just, right. I put it up on the, just the normal platforms. But any sponsors that you do, you handle yourself either, either through an agency that's working like as a consultant for you. 
Uh, I used to go through the agency route, and then just due to my relationship with Evan at Black Rifle, I just streamlined it and was like, you know what? Perfect. How about we just do this? So my point being that even within our world, the new media thing, um, there are varying degrees of people being bought. Now, if it comes to uh, networks and stuff like that, the people that are listening are concerned. My favorite creators on iHeartRadio, maybe they're part of a globalist conspiracy. Those guys, they help with production. They help you get guests and they sell ads, right? Like they're not, they're not really stepping It increases, yeah, it increases your reach largely in the experience I do have with those things. There are other platforms and maybe those platforms, whatever, they fall into whatever, uh, the globalists or whatever it might be. That doesn't mean you as somebody who has content on that platform is a part of that. Correct, yeah. Um, Um, My point being that even within that, you found it easier to streamline even what is already quite a streamlined yep. uh, way of working. So for somebody like Tucker, I would be really interested to know why Twitter, apart from the fact that you can reach what will probably hit 100 million plays in 24 hours, which there's no way even on YouTube that you could do that. If you did a 100 million plays on YouTube in 24 hours, you would be the number one trending video worldwide on that site. Of I think all time, Mr. probably. Beast's Mr. Beast's Squid Game video did somewhere in the region of 70 million, but that was a movie level production that was custom built for virality. Tucker just, I mean, it was a, a well crafted monologue. He was actually talking about this um, dam explosion. Have you seen this? Mm-mm. So uh, Tucker points to Kiev's uh, possible role in the Kakovka dam burst. Uh, so if it was intentional, it was not a military tactic. It was an act of terrorism, Tucker said, commenting on the incident. Blowing up the dam may be bad for Ukraine, but it hurts Russia more. And for precisely that reason, the Ukrainian government has considered destroying it. So basically, he's saying maybe this is a false flaggy type thing. Yeah. The water level below this dam has risen by 12 meters, which is... Like, <laughs> that's that's going to change some neighborhood that's layouts. A fucking city. <laughs> um, that's what used to be a city. <laughs> yeah, correct. Correct. You're now, your granny's now at the bottom of a lake. Totally. Um but my point being that he's able to talk about stuff that he wants yeah. without any restriction. I don't know how he's monetizing, and I would love to know why he chose Twitter, apart from Reach. Reach is self-evident. Is he being paid? There's no ads, as far as I can see. I do play for Twitter Blue, mm-hmm. which means maybe I'm ad-free, so perhaps there would have been pre-roll ads running before it. Maybe people that have watched it that don't pay for Twitter Blue can tell us, or whatever, if they saw ads. But you didn't do a... This episode is brought to you by yeah. anything. There was no ads running partway through. It could lead to that. I mean, I don't I don't know a whole lot about Tucker in the world that he comes from. I'm going to assume he was well taken care of when he was at Fox. So the move might actually be to drive awareness before the monetization. Yeah. Can you imagine the hammer you could swing in negotiation? Be like, oh, hey, by the way, I do about 100 million plays in 24 hours. <laughs> So here's my rate. Yeah, exactly. Oh, you don't like my rate? Next. Sorry. Yeah, dude. So again, for the people that don't know this world, I would guess you could probably charge between a 10 and a $20 CPM on that. So that's per thousand plays, which is a fucking ungodly yeah. amount of money. Let's just multiply that by a number that has a lot of zeros. Yeah, correct. <laughs> and I, you know, it doesn't matter how much Tucker was being paid at Fox. Yeah. I can guarantee it wasn't that much. Nobody nobody fucking talks no, those sorts of numbers. But I don't think he's in a rush to monetize. No, no. I think his move is probably build... Accumulate. Build foundation, because then you can take it. Then you're the, you're the captain of your own ship. You have your hand on the wheel and people can get on board, but you get to tell them what stateroom they're in as opposed to the other way around. Yes. And think about it this way. Tom Segura that does your mom's house, he pivoted from comedian, comedian with podcast, comedian with very well produced podcast, comedian with podcast and other podcasts under it to now network. Yeah. So he is vertically integrating himself further and further back up the chain. Smart. Yeah. And, the, you know, I don't know who runs, who directs the editorial policy at Fox News. Something tells me that I've never seen them on TV and I don't respect them as a creator. Oh, I they're not a creator. I bet you it's a lawyer. Probably. Yeah. But I respect Tom Segura as a creator. I know that he yeah. understands the craft. So I go, oh, yeah, that, that network has legitimacy. And Tucker Carlson will be able to lend legitimacy to other people that come below. It's the same with uh, Ben Shapiro on The Daily Wire, yeah. right? You know, Shapiro, Jeremy Boring. Jeremy, not necessarily front-facing, but you know, he's, he can, he's done well-crafted adverts, and I've seen him on podcasts, and he can speak. Mm-hmm. And, you know, in a world of uh, social media where people want that behind-the-scenes thing, they want to know Kim Kardashian's dog's name, and they want to know where Zac Efron goes for coffee on blah, blah, on his Instagram stories. I think that, that's, I think that gives a, a degree of sort of resonance. Yeah. I'll be curious to see what he does with it. I mean, what? I guess the better metric will be, how does the second video do? 
<laughs> dude, honestly. Well, if the, if the algorithm's anything to go by, yeah. that would be. One other thing that I haven't heard anybody talk about, one of my friends brought this up to me. Elon Musk pinned the What is a Woman yep. uh, documentary as a tweet. Elon Musk's 20-year-old child recently went through gender transition. Really? I did not know that. Yes, officially. I think that might be a name change or some sort of uh, intervention. Uh, Hmm. No one, as far as I'm aware, has brought up the fact that Elon is quite sort of forthcoming and vociferous about his stance on uh, trans stuff, especially around children. I wonder how much of that is driven by a personal investment. Yeah. Adds another sort of... Families get ugly, right? Every, yeah. People who tell me that you know they have a perfect family, it's like, let's go back a few generations. Let's shake the branches a bit. I can tell you right now, mine's got some interesting branches, as do they all. Um, so who knows? I mean, who knows the dynamic between father and child? Are they close? Are they antagonistic? I mean, I, yeah. we've all seen both. But, you know, the I watched that documentary. I don't find it to be controversial. It's an, It's a man asking a legitimate question, looking for information, valid, reasonable, articulatable responses that can be defended. Bring your idea. Let's bring it into the light, not the shadows. Let's investigate it. Let's ask questions and see what remains. Um, but yeah, I mean, it, that's a that's an issue that I can't – in the people that I have talked to, even inside of the trans community and the limited in, um, interaction that I have had, the answer is very widely. So – it you know who knows what's going on there between yep. child and father, and it's also not uncommon to have family members who have diametrically opposed beliefs, which is awesome at you know Thanksgiving. <laughs> well, I think uh, political leaning is sixty percent heritable, which means that you do have most of the family in one direction, yeah, and then the outliers perhaps yeah. in another. Load them up with some cocktails at holiday parties and let's just work it out. Yeah. I did Friendsgiving <laughs> last year, which was way better than Thanksgiving Yeah, because you actually get to choose your friends, but you don't get to choose your family. This is a very true statement. This is a very true statement. Yeah. Families get wild. I get it. I don't know a single person who, if, like, again, if you dig enough far enough back, you're going to have issues that uh, are oftentimes insurmountable. According to a new survey from the American Cato Institute, three in 10 Americans under 30 support the installation of cameras in the home to monitor wrongdoing. Strikingly, the figures were markedly different among the 18 to 30 cohort. Three in 10 support the installation of surveillance cameras. We can probably also map this to emerging support for intrusive digital surveillance on the growing body of studies, indicating that faith in and support for democratic norms is falling with every generation, even as the same group turns against open debate and academic freedom. In other words, there has been a pronounced turn away from the foundational liberal norms and towards a baseline of authoritarian control and surveillance in the name of safety, care, and the avoidance of harm. Cato Report speculates that this shift is generational, noting that the over 45s have a markedly different attitude to surveillance and suggesting that this is likely connected to the growing prioritization of safety. If you're used to interacting on social media and you're used to unaccountable authority and you've grown up partially online, you will see it as normal to surrender a measure of privacy, for example, allowing social media to track your behavior in exchange for access to the digital services that enable your virtual social life. Three in 10 want home surveillance inside. Who decides what's right and wrong? Who decides what's the appropriate, I have three kids. Um, we're just getting into birthday season. My daughter just turned 15. My middle son will turn 18 next month. And then my oldest son will turn 20. Wildly different. And it's just different between having boys and girls. There's a way that, and I learned this lesson the hard way. You know, I, I can talk to my sons in a tone of voice and not that I am aiming to do so, but I mean, you get frustrated as a parent, right? There's times where you're just like, you're at your wits end, and I've, there have been times where I've been very sharp and direct with my sons. I made that mistake one time with my daughter, and I watched her kind of wilt away. And it was, she was quite young, but I learned my lesson in that moment. But so for me, I ha- I kind of have a, and it's a floating scale as they evolve as human beings too, and they're processing. But right and wrong, who who decides in that surveillance? What, what is wrong doing? What is wrong doing? What what's the difference between wrongdoing and difficult parenting decisions that you have to make? Discipline, um, it like, and by discipline I'm not talking like Jocko get up at four thirty. I'm talking like take a nap, Jocko. You know, I'm talking like <laughs> discipline, discipline. Put your dishes away. Yeah, again, 
Or, you know, hey, you snuck out of the house at 13 years old and you were gone for two hours and I caught you coming back in. Oh, and it looks like you're shit-faced. These are hard parenting things that you have to deal with. The idea of surveillance, I, uh, I think it was a quote from Thomas Jefferson. It came up on my own podcast not too long ago, but it's essentially in a nutshell, and I'm sure you've heard it, is those who are will willing to sacrifice a small amount of freedom for an increase in safety are deserving of neither or security. And I, it's a, such a slippery slope. First off, I don't think most people have any idea how much the government is capable of collecting on them right now. Um, for most people, if you're listening to this, you need to assume that anything you do on an electronic device is at least being held somewhere. I don't think we have enough people or the computing bandwidth to look at it in real time, but we absolutely do retroactively. And people are like, oh, we know the government can't do that. There's rules in the constitution. It's like, okay, listen, there, go onto the internet, which you're probably spending most of your life on, and actually you're consuming this content on it anyway, and Google the partnerships between America and our allies and what we do when we want to flirt the constitution. We have our allies look inward because they have, <laughs> your country might be a little bit guilty of this, Chris. <laughs> We might have a partnership with a couple people across the ocean that have access to the same data that can look in because they don't have to worry about the constitutional rights of American citizens. I would imagine that we have a reciprocal agreement with them as well. There are ways around all of this stuff. I have tried to teach my kids since they had access to electronic devices that anything you do on an electronic device lasts forever. And you should be aware of that. Um, and I actually think it's a vast overreach by the United States government. I think the government has the ability to know far too much about its citizens, and people should be really upset about that. I really don't think that there is a breadcrumb trail that you can follow where if a government knows more about you, you are actually safer as a people. Mm. I think there is a breadcrumb trail where you can follow that the more the government knows about you, probably the less secure that you are. I mean, I'm sorry if you look at what's going on in the FBI, um, and I just had an FBI agent who retired after 20 years on my podcast, and he was talking about the shift in the higher levels of the FBI. Government organizations can be weaponized in directions because of what the government knows about people and their beliefs, and they shouldn't know those things. The Patriot, How so? You got an example? Uh, the websites that you visit. Are you a member of the NRA? Are you a member of this or that organization? Did you visit this website? Um, what have you posted? What do you post about? What type of things do you – they can get a really good profile about who you are as a person. And these large organizations, people forget often, I think, that they're just a conglomerate of, of individuals. If you get a large amount of individuals that all think the same way pointed in one direction, the result that you're going to get from that is going to be biased. And I think it, it, people are so willing to allow the government to look into their life. In my opinion, the government should know almost nothing about you and I, but we should know everything about the government and what they're doing. And it's completely backwards right now. Dude, it's scary. It's scary stepping over here into America. You guys have a much closer read, even if you – think that most Americans aren't sufficiently concerned about what the government knows about them and aren't sufficiently aware, it's a conversation that is much more surface level and much more front and center. Uh, in the UK, it's just, it's not a, a real discussion. We don't have, we don't uphold the virtues of, of freedom from tyranny and all the rest of it in the same way that you guys do. Um, now, I have no idea about whether our government is or is not surveilling us. As in, uh, I can answer that for you. Yes. <laughs> 100%. 100%. Well, there we are. <laughs> Fuck it. We should we need to have a conversation, Britain. We need to have a conversation about freedom. But I mean the the especially the thing about looking at your surveillance inside the house and you make a really great point that who determines what is or is not acceptable behavior. You know, we've said for quite a while when it comes to having conversations on the internet, are there topics that should be beyond the pale that you're not allowed to talk about? And even if there are topics that you can talk about, de facto you can't talk about them because of the sort of response. If you start yeah. bringing up race and IQ, that's not going to be allowed. If you start bringing up stuff to do with anti-Semitism or conspiracy theories to do with certain ethnic groups, that's also not going to be particularly well-liked. And, you know, maybe very good, very good reasons that 
it's hard to work out who is a good actor that's genuinely having a, a good faith interested conversation to try and find out truth and who is a bad actor that's trying to be the front end of the funnel toward a, a KKK march, right? It's difficult to, to pass apart those two. I think the better question is, would you rather have conversations that may not be agreeable to people happening in public or have those same conversations that are still going to happen occurring in private? I think as a society, we are better off having them occur in public. My theory is pull things into the light. If you push things into the shadows, you can't really see what's going on in there. And I think it creates an environment and room for things to turn quite sour. Correct. Well, the the problem with censorship and the reason that it doesn't work is that it doesn't stop people thinking things. Yeah. It just means that they no, no longer are truthful about the things that they think. They pick and choose where they tell the truth. Correct. As I mean, as we all do, but on, on issues like that, it's – yeah, I, I would rather know the racist that lives next door to me mm. than be surprised by it years down the road. Yep. So, well, you know, there is still, even for the best meaning amongst us, uh, a degree of pushback, a potential risk of cancellation, uh, retribution in one regard or another when you talk about these things in public or online or whatever. But in the safety of your own home, when you're talking about this, you have a, a wife that is interesting and, and philosophically you can have really difficult discussions about cool things. We had a chat uh, around a poll a couple of weeks ago about the dysgenic effect of abortion. So the fact that uh, abortion is more easily accessed by people who are richer, people who are richer are better able to do family planning, which actually means that restricting access to abortion encourages more working class and underclass children to accidentally be born off the back of this, which actually means that you are propagating more poverty uh, than you are propagating more rich people. And there was maybe a conspiracy that restricting this could be done from top down to ensure that we have enough workers to continue to do the jobs that are laborious that the bourgeoisie don't necessarily want to do. Great word. Bourgeoisie. <laughs> yeah, I love Fuck it. Fuck yeah. <laughs> uh, but you go, okay, That that's like talking about dysgenic, that's the literally the opposite of eugenic. That's pretty sort of triggery word. Then you're talking about some stuff to do with group conspiracy. You're talking about, you know, class differences and all of the rest of it. Fascinating comments. Some super, super smart people sat around like three world poker stars and a bunch of other people. And I was like, fuck, this is awesome. I'm really, yeah. really engaged in this conversation, listening to these people explain a topic that I didn't really understand. But if that was part of this new home at home installation surveillance thing, and the child or the young daughter who doesn't like the idea that mum and dad have got their friends around talking about this with poker players, they press the button that oh, they say, I want to report this f for thought crime or whatever. And Tom Cruise comes in and you're fucked. He puts a halo on you. Yes. Yes, correct. Oh, that's – what was that? <laughs> Not premonition. What the fuck was oh, it? Uh, Majority report? Yes. Yes. There it is. Fuck yeah. Also, let's say we allow – let's go down this pipeline. Yes. Let's say we tell the government for whatever reason we lose our – goddamn minds and we say you know what u.s government we're gonna let you put cameras in our homes my asshole is wide open please enter do you seriously i am a gape do you <laughs> <laughs> what a word one on the board for bourgeoisie one on the word for gape referring to yourself as a gape is like oh my fucking god that's all i got for today people i'm out of here good um what do you think the odds are of them ever saying, you know what, we should take these back out. Yeah. You know what, this is enough. We have cameras, you know, but these are these are 1080p. We need to upgrade this with some 8K. And honestly, you know, we were only kind of getting some camera views. Yeah. How about the bedroom? We need a bedroom, the and we're going to need the audio too, because you know, what if people are using nonverbal? What if it's nonverbal abuse of things that are incorrect? I don't know of a history of of in the U.S. of giving the government. An incredible amount of power, which, in my opinion, observation cameras in in the homes of citizens is one insane, but an incredible amount of power. I don't have an example of them willingly giving it back. Correct. That is a razor blade that every step that you take, you are going to cut it's yourself. A, it's even like a deeper. ratchet, right? Oh. It clicks down, and yeah. it's like okay, it can only go one direction, and it's not a good direction. Yeah, that's a tourniquet that you're putting on and putting on and putting on and putting on, and next thing you know, your limb is getting sawed off. In, under the guise of safety. So I think the interesting 
uh, part there was if you're used to interacting on social media, you're used to unaccountable authority, and if you've grown up online, you will see it as normal to surrender a measure of privacy in exchange for digital services that enable your social life. It definitely seems to me that this sort of generalized risk aversion, uh, this optimization for convenience, comfort, um, uh, safety mm -hmm. over freedom slash genuine privacy. Well, they, uh, grew, they don't know a world without it. Correct. You know, my, all three of my kids, again, they, they didn't grow up. My daughter, probably the most. Um, digitally native. Digitally native. My son's pr not, not 100%, but not as much as my daughter. They don't really know or understand a world without that device and what that device can create for them. It's hilarious when I explain to them going to the library and looking for books about, you know, the career I wanted to go into when I was younger. They're like, why would you, why would you do that? Or ringing a friend to tell yeah. them where you'll meet them. Yeah. Because once you're out of the house, you have no other way of getting in contact yeah. with them. One of the most hilarious conversations with my middle son, I was explaining to him a pager. He goes, that's the dumbest shit I've ever heard in my life. <laughs> Oh, wait a minute. A number that I have to call that goes to a device that beeps you and you'll call me on another device? Why would you just combine this? So I'm like, yeah, well, the apes were still figuring it out. It took dude. a while. <laughs> yeah. Right? yeah. Steve Jobs wasn't born yet. Yeah. No, he truly thought that I was from the dumbest species in the history of man when I was explaining a pager to him. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, man. And, you know, if you've spent all of this time with at your fingertips, yeah. the most controlled, I can, I choose what I get exposed to. Yeah. Anything that I am exposed to, which is remotely objectionable, I can report. So why can't I report things in the real world? If most of my social experiences occur online, most of the interactions, most of the stuff that I consume happens on the internet. On average, mm -hmm. Americans spend three hours and 43 minutes per day on their phones. For Gen Z, it's going to be way, way, yeah. way higher than that. That's spread across the entire nation. 20 years ago, that time didn't exist. So where's it come from? It's been squeezed out of real life experiences, yeah. right? So if you spend most of your time consuming things on the internet and there's a report button or a block button or a mute button, when you're walking through the real world and you get exposed to things that you're not happy with, well, I can't, where's the yeah. fucking... I, th I also think you steal your ability to develop resilience through the hardship that you have to experience growing up. I mean, growing up is not an easy thing. Um, and I don't think it should be easy. How old are you? 35. Okay. I'm um, so I got 10 years on you. I'm the person that I am today because of the experiences that I went through. My parents went through absolutely no effort to try to uh, make my life devoid of things that were challenging. If actually, it, if I look back on it, as a parent myself now, I'm like, holy shit. They actually, for one, I thought I was Jason Bourne growing up. I'm like, I was I was the Jason Bourne, but I failed a chromosome test. So I was a little bit short on my, you know, spy ability. <laughs> I got away with nothing, but they let me get away with a lot because they had some boundaries that they were letting me operate inside of mm -hmm. because they knew I had to fail. They knew I had to suffer the consequences of that failure. They knew that not every social interaction was going to be great. They knew I was going to have conflicts and therefore have to develop conflict resolution skills as I was growing up. I tripped, I fell, I scuffed myself up, and I learned from those things. And I think if you rob people of those opportunities, you are developing the softest generation of human beings possible. And that's not, that's not what I want for anybody. It's not what I want for this nation, for any nation, or the world in general. Yeah, I saw, I quoted this in my newsletter this week about the stats of how few Americans can join. 76% of, of American adults aged 17 to 24 are either too obese to qualify or have other medical issues or criminal histories that would make them ineligible to serve in the U.S. Armed Forces without a waiver. I wish that number was higher. <laughs> <laughs> I'm being dead serious. I hear people... I'm all about inclusivity. Like, I don't have a problem with inclusivity. It bothers me when it's inclusivity for inclusivity's purpose and just for just so we can say we're inclusive. I think that the military should be very exclusive. I think it should be extremely difficult to be able to join and proceed down a pipeline that you want to go down. Because at the end of the day, you, I look at what is it that you want to do and what are the standards for that job? What are they based off of? And, and I, I can only speak through the lens of my own previous military experience. The standards that are that our job was based on and that we were held to came from a battlefield. And I don't give a shit about your woke ideology because none of that matters 
when you're covered with your friend's brains. Not a single stretch of that shit matters whatsoever. All of those ideologies and all of these platforms and, and ideas that people want to put onto the military just so they can say that they did, I think that they should be removed. I think it should be super hard to get into the military. We should exclude most people from it because they don't meet the physical standard, the uh, whatever standards are listed, with the uh, intelligence standard, the educational standards, all of those things. That's a good thing. Um, I think we are headed down the wrong path when we just start opening the doors up and letting all of those people in, because that is not a military that is based to operate in the environment that the standards are based upon. I had a conversation with Heather MacDonald, who has written a book called When Race Trumps Merit, and she's talking about how affirmative action for different ethnic groups is causing meritocracy to kind of be thrown out of the window. And it's it kind of it's really uncomfortable actually to to kind of go through because there's a lot of pretty sort of harsh and and disquieting stats that you start to learn. But the main thing that I realized was most people, most sane people, wouldn't have a problem with the military having an incredibly rigorous standard for entry because they understand that if you get this wrong, mortal danger is on the other yep. side of it, right? If you have somebody that is unable to keep up with the rest of their platoon because of their physical fitness or because they've got diabetes or because they've got a gluten intolerance or whatever, that person puts themselves and everybody else at risk. But really, almost all industries are just a difference of degree, not a difference of kind away from that. So she used this example of uh, underrepresentation uh, within Alzheimer research or Parkinson's research. But the problem that you have, if you start to do uh, an excessive amount of affirmative action in that, uh, especially if you completely disregard or mostly disregard meritocracy, is that you slow down Parkinson's and Alzheimer's research, mm -hmm. which is directly impacting people's quality of life. Yeah. So, okay, it's not mortal danger, but it's like health span and lifespan. And it's mortal danger for some. Precisely. So you go, okay. And then, so where, at, at which point, all the way down to the checkout operator, you know, like at, at what point do we say that this doesn't have a... a, a operating based on merit doesn't have a place to be within this system. It's really hard to find a line at which you go, yeah, it's, it's about there. It's about the person that professionally does cro crochet or fucking bakes cakes or something yeah. like that, you know? I mean, I, I think that the, the conversation should be had and it's probably going to be a shifting scale depending on what you're talking about. Um, you know, should it be as difficult to join the military as it is to work at a Dunkin' Donuts? No. Right, like we need to be able to have a, sl a sliding scale. We're an advanced species; we have the ability to think. Let's use that skill a little bit more. Did you see that um, criticism around Navy SEAL selection being too harsh, uh, as SEALs were sprayed with tear gas and forced mm -hmm. to sing "Happy Birthday"? Yeah, you see this video. Yeah, it's it fucking ago. awesome. <laughs> What's your thoughts on that? Um, I mean, I, I say that a little bit tongue in cheek. First off, anybody who's been through that pipeline has experienced that. And there's a few ways that you can look at it. Uh, from my understanding, what I will say is this. From my understanding, from what I have heard from other instructors that were there, those particular instructors, instructors were a little bit off the reservation. And this can happen because instructors, again, you wear this blue and gold t-shirt and your hat and your shorts and you roll your socks a super dumb way. And it's just people. They might all look the same to the outside perspective, but just because you're an instructor or even a SEAL doesn't mean that you're a good person by any stretch. You get the wrong person in the wrong role, bad shit is going to happen. So the amount of CS gas that they were exposed to, from my understanding, exceeded what the, um, what do they call it? It's a, God, of course I can't remember right now. It's every, evo it's an evolution cheat. So everything that happens in SEAL training, the, the room for imagination is almost non-existent. It's basically like pull the three ring binder. Here is what we are trying to accomplish. It's like, you know, the mission statement. Here's what we're trying to accomplish. Here's our boundaries. This is the evolution. This is what it is. This is how long we're going to do it for. The students don't know this. So as a student, it's very chaotic. I didn't know this until I went back as an instructor. I'm like, holy shit. Like basically every There's day. There's the limits to this. The limits are unbelievable. And the safety net should be incredibly robust, but also invisible to the students. There's a portion of that training. I'm like, yeah, you may, maybe you should feel like you're going to die. You're not going to die. We're not going to. We're going to do our absolute utmost to prevent you from dying, even though it does happen. Um, but there's a psychological test there as well. It's a physical and mental crucible. So 
I have no issue with people being exposed to CS gas because I was exposed to CS gas. Uh, the third phase of training occurs out on San Clemente Island, which is where that video came from. The problem I have with it is the training and those evolution sheets, and again, those standards, you can draw a very precise breadcrumb trail to the why. Why do we expose people to CS gas in training? Well, because one, it's very common, and the first time that you're exposed to it probably shouldn't be for real. So what do we need to do? We should expose it to people in a training environment where we can have a robust medical staff. Problem is, from my understanding, they involved people in that that actually weren't necessarily directly involved in the training pipeline. They exposed them to far too much gas. And one of the biggest issues I have with it is that there was some fucking idiot there filming it with a cell phone. Do your job. Because I tell you right now, filming it for your Instagram page is not your job. And I don't know what you think is going to come from that. And the reason they make you sing happy birthday is that that requires you inhale and exhale. It's the same. They, they do that. It's Is that what you did? Uh, we didn't. It, they didn't have us sing happy birthday. They, they There's all these like frogman songs that you sing when you're in training. And they'll just have you do something that increases your respiration. Because there's some people out there that can hold their breath a really long time. <laughs> <laughs> now that holding your breath in an environment like it's still it's on your clothes it's it sucks what's it like what's it what's it burns um have you ever uh well i was <laughs> my sister one time had like a little uh mace spray thing and i had i don't know why i had it in my pocket and i sprayed it on myself and then wiped my eyes i was gonna say have you ever done that but most people haven't because they're not idiots no so <laughs> it would be it's uh it burns you it it really burns your eyes water an unbelievable amount um, within a few seconds, you'll be questioning how it's possible that your body creates as much mucus as coming out of your body. Um, you cough. It can make it seem like people, it's hard to breathe. For some people, they describe it as, as they're inhaling like flames from this, like very hot. Is it is it going to kill you? Unless you have an underlying medical condition, I think it's so highly unlikely. Does it feel like it's going to kill you? Probably to some people. And that's the point. We have to expose students to those things that they may be exposed to overseas. I would rather have a student have that experience and know the cognitive decline, the physical decline, the emotional decline, and the impact that it's going to have on their ability to do their job in training before it happens in real life. Now, if the instructor staff went 1% beyond what is on that evolution sheet, then they are wrong for doing that because that evolution is based on that real world requirement. If they used 5x the gas or 10x the gas, then they should be punished for that particular activity. But the, the evolution in and of itself is essential. Now, somebody looking at that on Instagram could be like, oh, well, that looks like torches. Like, you don't know anything about this job. You're, I'm not saying your opinion isn't valid. I'm just not going to pay any attention to it because you don't know what you're talking about. Unidentified anomalous phenomena. Are we talking about aliens? Yeah. Fuck yeah. God, I hope they're real. Yeah. Why are people scared of aliens? I would have one on the podcast. Yeah. I don't know what the fuck we'd talk about. But I mean, if there's aliens out there, which I think there are, mathematically, I think it's improbable that we are alone out here. It's uh, Our ability as a species to think that we are so incredibly unique shocks me sometimes. <laughs> if they're here visiting, I have to believe that they are more advanced than we are. I would assume, I and mean, obviously technologically, because they're covering a distance that we are not capable of covering. Um, it seems like they are able to evade detection to a degree. And I would honestly guess that if we are seeing them, it's because they would want us to see them. But both of those things combined lead me to believe like if they wanted to fuck us up, they probably already could have and would have. So I don't know. I think maybe like we're the comedy planet to them. Like you win a prize on some other planet. And they're like, dude, you just won the best prize ever. We're going to send you to this other planet and you're not going to believe the shit that you're going to see. And so they come and they watch and they laugh and they go back and they tell tales of how dumb we are. But it doesn't work. Like, like, let's get on like, this is awesome. Sit down and like have a chat with me or like Bluetooth to my mind or whatever that works. I'm not interested in the probing part, you know, but like, and I don't know why that was such a narrative early on. <laughs> yeah, I, kind of like a Freudian thing that, wasn't it? And I got taken up into the sky. They levitated yeah. me up. And the first thing that they did. Always right up the ass. Yeah. It's like, I, they were... They were forced to be a gape. <laughs> a gape, that's it. Yeah. I love the fact that it's like... 
<laughs> it's using a verb as a noun. You have so few times in life to use that word that I think you should seize as much as possible. Seize the Let's day get it in can. a few more times yeah. before we finish up. So David Grush, this guy yeah. that's the dude. Yep. I've watched a good bit of stuff on him and his story. In your professional opinion. Yep. How reliable do you think that this particular person's story, security access, clearance, all the rest of it is? So I have very limited knowledge of him. I actually was exposed to his videos for the first time yesterday um, in a very in a very brief article. Um, so he was in the Air Force. I think he was an intelligence officer. He held a TSSCI clearance. Um, and apparently he worked for a program that was – peripheral or directly involved in identifying UAPs is what I think they call it. Call it aliens. You know, military officer, cool. Intelligence officer, great. TSSCI clearance. What's that? It's top secret special compartmentalized information. And it sounds like a big deal, but it, honestly, it's not. I mean, if you look at the uh, – not too long ago, there was a National Guardsman, the, the intelligence leak. He was uh, he had a TSSCI clearance and access to these databases because oftentimes you know to hold certain jobs you have to have certain clearances. It's the same clearance that I had when I was uh, at the SEAL, t- uh, SEAL team on the East Coast, and it takes about two years to actually get the clearance. So oftentimes you'll get the job and they'll just give you an interim clearance, meaning you have the clearance and access to the stuff as if you it had the background investigation had been complete. But then it takes like two years to catch up to it. It's not an uncommon clearance. It's cool to say and write out, like, oh, top TSSCI clearance. He must know everything. I was read into, with that clearance, in the course of 17 years, I was read into a few programs that offline I can give you a few Google search words, and you would literally be able to find the information on the internet. People's thoughts that Jason Bourne is like out there. Maybe there is. In my experience, that's not the case. It's a combination and like this vice of like 60 people's careers jammed into one unique little coin. And that's just not the way that it works. So I don't doubt that he might have worked on a program that was basically around um, identifying unidentified shit in the air. Like that's probably a good idea. Like, hey, we're kind of seeing these things that we don't know what they are. Let's put together some people to do that. From my understanding, that was nested inside of the Air Force. What he was referencing in the video and what he seems to be referencing when he kind of made like the the tour of uh, the media tour is, well, there's this other program and it's their job to actually collect things. And what I'm hearing is from these people, these senior officers, they are telling me about things that they saw. And for me personally, now we're talking like second and third hand information. It's like, listen, he's like, well, we weren't read into this program and we weren't we weren't allowed access to that one. And that's totally common. Compart- oh, that's the C. Yeah, the compartmentalization is totally common. That's the C in his status, yeah. I was not read into programs that other people at the commands that I was read into because there's two things you have to have. You have to have this appropriate security clearance, but then also the need to know. Just because you have a TSSCI doesn't mean you're like walking into a skiff, which is like a room about this size where they keep all this dumb secret shit or access to programs. You don't just get to go like, oh, hey, uh, yeah, I'll be in the skiff for the next three hours and you're just thumbing through stuff. That's like a not, library. Yeah, it's not the way that it works. So if this guy's job, which I don't doubt that he held that job, and I don't even necessarily doubt that other people would be coming up to him and saying to him, hey, this is what I saw and, and this is what I did. But it's not uncommon that they are going to separate programs that might have something to do with each other. But the best way to keep a secret is to keep it compartmentalized and separate. Like I'm sure that even when it went back to uh, you know creating the, first, the Manhattan Project, I bet you there were people who were working on that project that years later were like, oh, shit. I actually designed that. Was that. Me. Well, I designed that was my housing. That yeah, was my fucking. Wheel I designed for the that plane. wire. They had no idea why, yeah. because it was compartmentalized. Yeah. Why? Because we were trying to keep it a secret. So, I personally don't think that we're alone. I hope that we're not alone. Like I would legitimately like, what's up, dude? Let's go have a beer. Alien, do you drink beer? Like, what's going on here? I don't think there's as much to be scared of as people may think. But these people coming forward, like I have all this secret information, and then I'm not going to actually give you a shred of it to me, puts their legitimacy in question. Anybody that doesn't have first-hand knowledge of something. But there's some other interesting stuff that in order to be able to communicate this information, he had to get, I think it's Department of Defense or uh, Security, Homeland Security clearance to be able to say these things. 
and he was allowed. That's not much of a whistleblower then. He's, no, so he was allowed to say these things. Yeah. They said so. They have determined that what he was going to say is not classified information. Yeah, because he had to get the clearance in order to be able to get this out. At least this is what was reported on Fox News. So then, what the hell is actually going on? Joe's theory is that they're trying to steal more money from us. <laughs> Who? <laughs> the government. They're trying to distract us with aliens while they pass some other shit that uh, takes more money from us. Oh, okay. He thinks it's a false. Flag. Look over there. The aliens are yep. over there. The debt ceiling. Nobody needs to see this. He his he, he's landing more on. I think this is actually a, an intelligence operation trying to point our uh, attention. False flag. Yeah. Actual false in another flag. direction. But a psychological false flag. Yeah. Well, here's the thing. What was, who was that? Um, that president that said, uh, "If only we were attacked by an alien force, we would. How quickly would humanity's differences be forgotten?" So it was maybe Reagan or somebody like that. Anyway, uh, the point being that at the moment, because largely life is very comfortable and there is no existential threat apart from the ones that people make up and population collapse. Uh, apart from the ones that people are concerned about that are in the news. The only enemies that people have are the ones inside, right? The ones internal to their nation. I actually think that if you were to say there is a, an alien civilization that's out there, we're not sure if it's hostile or if it's uh, benign, you would actually end up with quite a bit of cohesion. Because for the first yeah. time ever, humans' tribal biases are able to be deployed against something other than humans. Well, it's a threat for the entire population, just not one segment of the population. Correct. People are brought together much more over shared hatreds than shared loves. At the moment, there is more hatred than there is love. But if the hatred could be directed at something in the sky or at somebody out there, you could white pill this and say, oh, well, it's, it's, you know, there's actually a potential good that comes out of this. But yeah, I, I don't know, man. It's the, the, There's a lot of different people that are part of this story, the, like this lady that's involved that was uh, helped to feed David this information is this lady that's been a part of sort of a UFO truther conspiracy thing yeah. for many years. Well, let's, so let's say that, let's play this out as if everything he's saying is true. So he was not part of the program specifically, but he's hearing that there is a program that exists somewhere nested inside of the DOD that they go out and they retrieve all of these things. For one, that would be an enormous operation. Where First off, you'd have to staff it and man it. So we're talking, you'd have to have aircraft specifically de dedicated for that. So you'd have people up front flying the aircraft. You'd have people in the back of the aircraft and the people in the back of the aircraft are going to be probably junior personnel. And my point in all this is like the more people that see this, the more people that like try to keep a secret among five people and then add a zero to that and then add a zero to that. How, how is the this vector of leakage? That's what I'm saying. Like you're trying to tell me that somewhere there it, it's nested inside of the DOD and they have a dedicated wing that's doing this and they're flying all over the place and nobody can give me one concrete shred of evidence. Well, that's uh, you, you said earlier on about people need to be able to sort of hold two thoughts in their mind at once. This is a relatively difficult one for some people some of the time to do, which is the government and the New World Order is unbelievably sophisticated and able to coordinate itself so that global health passports and microchips in our vaccines and aliens are able to be kept from us. And also... The government is so useless that I wouldn't trust them with anything, and they are completely incompetent in all of the rest of it. It's like, yo, which one is it? Yeah. Which one is it? Is it that they're able to coordinate a half-thousand-person operation to be able to go and retrieve the most valuable artifact of non-human origin ever discovered, even including meteors? In, pe in plain sight, and we haven't figured it out yet. <laughs> and not a single, not a single verifiable leak? Yeah. Or is it that they're completely useless and nobody should ever be trusted and the government needs to get the fuck out of my life. I'm totally fine with both of those things being true, that there can be portions of it that do both. In my opinion, what is it? Hanlon's razor do not attribute to malice that which can be explained by stupidity. It's like, do yeah. not attribute to conspiracy that which can be explained by people that just really, really, really are good at lying. Agreed. And, you know, there could be a third option somewhere in between those two where you kind of said it. There's a small – because the government and these organizations are just people. Would it be possible to find people that are super capable and competent and operate well inside of an incompetent government? Mm. Yes. Well, that's the C again, right? That's what I'm saying. Yes, you could. But, man, I – my personal bullshit meter goes off pretty, pretty rapidly. And also – and I don't know why – 
there was something about the way that the individual was talking about it that just it's like mm. the good instinct. Yeah, it's like I don't know, man. Maybe he's telling the tr- maybe he's talking about things he truly believes. Uh, but there was there was something about it that rung off to me. That's always something that I find interesting. You know, when there's a, a, a missing child and the parents go out and they do the press tour. There was this uh, girl called Madeleine McCann in the UK, very famous child that went missing, I think, in Turkey in sort of the mid nineties. And the number of conspiracies about her parents, that they'd kidnapped her or they'd sold her into slavery or they'd been negligent to her or some other bullshit, uh, which very well may be true. Um, And people were analyzing how they'd done their press conferences. And one of the interesting things I reflected on there is they were saying, these people are unreliable actors. Look at it. Nobody, nobody would act this way when giving a press conference about their lost daughter. I'm like, oh, sorry, hang on. Where's the fucking handbook of examples of how people are supposed to normally behave <laughs> yeah, when their child is studies? fucking missing? Like, because there's two, they've either killed her, chopped her up and, and spread her in the sea or she's been stolen, right? Like, I can give you way more options than that. Let's be creative. How are you? <laughs> yeah, you're, you're, the guy, you're the guy that would dispose of the body. So, but my point being like, how... How are you supposed to behave? Like, how do you behave? And the same thing goes for this guy. So, you know, in terms of some degrees of freedom, let's say that you do have these, you know, again, do not attribute to malice that which can be explained by stupidity or perhaps... Um, uh, Incompetence. Uh, yeah, or culpability or, or believability from this guy. You know, he he could be telling the truth. So you've been given this information by these people that have said that this is true. They seem reputable to you. Perhaps they also believe that it is reputable. Perhaps it's second or third hand from them. You don't know where it goes. What's the playbook for how you're typically supposed to be able to give an interview to the press claiming that this is potentially the first alien craft? But the other thing, what was it he said? He said something about there's been a, a non-human remain. Oh, you know, he, he almost read it like a novel. It was like, there's been, uh, he typically said there would be what, a pilot. Exactly. And, uh, you know, that's the same in this one. I'm like, hey, is this a fucking thriller novel or something? Well, also don't forget, you know, both you and I, I'm used to being around cameras. Like they don't bother me anymore. I could only imagine, let's say, let's again, go down the thought process of he, everything he has is the truth. And he is actually trying to be a whistleblower. And this is the first time he's ever had a camera in front of his face. Nerves. You're going to ask a little, you're going to act a little awkward. Yep. You know? yep. 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 Yeah. NASA has got this panel for UAPs apparently, and they are encouraging commercial pilots to come forward. Did you talk about this? Do you hear no. about this? So this is pretty interesting. So, NASA's got this panel, right? There's these UAPs that are happening. Again, this may be a uh, uh, part of the conspiracy to the false flag thing. But what they're doing is it seems like commercial pilots, because they spend way more time in the skies mm-hmm. than all militaries combined yep. by a fucking huge margin, they uh, observe a variety of strange aerial phenomena. But there is a stigma in the commercial aviation community around pilots submitting this. Yeah, because they're going to think you're crazy. (laughs) In February alone, the FAA had 68 reports from commercial pilots. So this is NASA trying to encourage a cultural shift amongst commercial pilots for them to come forward so that they're going to be less reluctant to report it because, again, you're going to be shunned and and, and maybe mocked as a crazy person. Uh, And yeah, in February alone, the FAA had 68 reports of... Uh, UAPs by commercial pilots. I think we should embrace it. I, I mean, if we're not alone and they want to come here, I don't think we're going to stop them. So let's embrace the fact that it's possible. And, you know, the commercial pilots, yeah, I think for years the stigma has been, oh, you believe in aliens? Tractor beam, huh? Probe? Yeah, I get it. Gape? Yeah, totally. So I think, I actually think it's a really good thing. Um, I actually have quite a bit of flying experience. And sometimes you see weird shit up there Report it. And what you're going to get is probably the vast majority of those things are things that were reported that can be explained, but you might get a small uh, minority of them where you can look into it and we can develop a better understanding of whether or not we are alone or not. Just, just tell the goddamn truth. If you see something you don't understand, that's unrecognizable, make a report on it. And yeah, I, I, per- I just, I'd rather lean into it. Make some popcorn, invite them down. Like, why not? Yeah, man, it's interesting that it, it's everything seems to be picking up speed. 
whether it be conversations about AI and recursive self-improvement, whether it's nanotechnology or bioweapons or natural pandemics or engineered pandemics or aliens or whatever, um, I think the next five to ten years is going to be a real fever pitch for stuff. Because if it keeps increasing, if it keeps I mean, getting, aren't we at vertical? <laughs> Yeah, pretty, pretty, it's the inflection is feeling pretty like the hockey stick is very hockey sticky at the moment. Yeah, I don't know how much more vertical that we can get. Yeah, it's gonna, I would describe it as wild. It's gonna be a wild time. Yeah. I'm glad that I live in a remote section of Montana. Maybe give me a little bit of buffer. Is that where you are? Yeah, Fuck yeah, yeah, up in the northwestern section. It's, I need, you know, just a little physical buffer. Yeah, I'm not saying it's, they, they can come visit me there too. Yeah. I actually prefer that they did. I welcome arms. Yeah, come on in. But it's going to be a little bit you're, – you're going to be later in the day. Yeah. It'll buy me a little time ge- uh, geographically, topographically. It'll buy me a little bit of time. What is your opinion on this sort of – I'm seeing this more and more, especially since I've moved to America. This sort of very uh, – it's not quite being a prepper, but it's kind it's of – being prepared? No. It's like military LARPing. It's oh, like people yeah. people that like to wear sort of tactical wear as casual wear, uh, people who are maybe non-military but could be relatively wealthy but spend a good bit of time sort of surrounding themselves with military or or, yeah. or with firearms and doing lots of tactical training and stuff like that. It's a it's a tenuous balance because it can absolutely be taken too far. I mean, the things that get reported are like individual buries a school bus and makes it into a bunker and lives out of that and is putting camel paint on every day and waiting in the bushes for an unseen government entity that's probably never going to come because they know you're crazy and you're isolated and it's like oh the guy's in this trench again we well, don't like need to go out Japanese, there Japanese uh, guy or the, <laughs> the Vietnamese soldier or whatever that would stay for stop years until, yeah. yeah there was one in Guam too I think he finally came out of the cave like 20 years later Yeah. so that would be I think like the pejorative of prepper because it, de- it definitely I think it does have a, a pejorative slant to it. But I also think that people should take a very holistic view of how much they rely on other people to be able to do their day to day. And if people do that, it's kind of shocking. I mean, water, power, food, housing, transportation, information, all of these things. And I'm not saying that everybody needs to have a diesel generator in their apartment and an HF radio set and 60 days worth of food. And somehow you're siphoning like gutter water into your house into 55 gallon drums. There's a balance in between the, like, so there's A and B, right? There's, there's a balance in between. I think, and it, it kind of goes back to resilient resiliency. If there was a catastrophe and actually I was, uh, I was down here a couple of years ago when Texas got the, they had like an inch of ice on the ground and it was Armageddon snow, you know, it almost ground people. Did these people are pussies with cold weather? Well, but not, I mean, there's, there's, there's that aspect of it. Let's remember who said that it wasn't me, but, <laughs> but they also like the infrastructure, like when the power went out for four days, people were losing their fucking minds. Yeah. It's like, you can actually prepare yourself even just through knowledge on how to navigate something like that. You don't have to have all of those things. I think you should have, I mean, so where I live, for example, is slightly different. Um, There are places in Montana that can get a little Western physically and metaphorically and response time from first responders is going to be 45 minutes to an hour, depending on where you're at. You need to, in certain times a year, have the ability to handle your own shit until a higher level of care comes. And that might be a couple of days. So I think in that environment, you need to at the very least think in those considerations. But it, I just, I, I, I hate people who just willingly outsource everything that they need for their life mm. to somebody else. And they don't take any ownership of it. And then there's the other far end, like you're talking about the people who want to wear you know, military flair and regalia, and they want to talk about a civil war while they're posting pictures of themselves on the fucking internet with their optics on their rifles on backwards. It's like, <laughs> I'll send you plenty of them. It's, it's a hobby of mine to look at that. And you know, it's, I hate people who call, who are calling for civil war. People have no idea what it is that they are asking for. They have no idea what that, that would actually look like. And for some reason, they seem to think that it would save the country as opposed to just destroy the country. Yeah. Um, I, I had a conversation with a friend who spends a lot of time shooting and is very responsible. And he 
sort of talked me through his progression that he had of becoming a, a gun owner and mm. then becoming sort of competent and then proficient and then kind of where he's at now. Uh, and he was saying that he's fluxed in his um, desire for an incident to occur an awful lot. And it's kind of given him emotional and existential whiplash uh, because of what's happened. And I, I mentioned to him, and I'm sure that you'll be familiar with this as well, that there are some people who spend a good bit of time around firearms. And when I'm around them, I get a sense of hunger. They want something to happen. For something to kick off because yeah. they've done all of this training and they've spent all of this time thinking about the bad guy. And you you roll BJJ, you want to compete, right? You you do boxing, you want to get into the ring. You don't just hit the pads all the time. You want to actually... And I mentioned it to him and he said, uh, I've actually become as I've got super out into expert level, I've become more and more reticent around using my firearm because I know that that's the last time I'm probably ever going to pull a trigger. Yeah. If I shoot a person, even if it's in the most unequivocal self-defense ever, I'm probably not going to be able to shoot another firearm again in my entire life. And you still may lose in civil court. Yep. I have, uh, I have been around more weapons-based violence than almost every human being on the face of the planet. And I say that because almost nobody is actually exposed to it. But in the job that I came from, that was literally, if you, at the end of the day, if you refine everything down and what is it that, what, what was our job? It was to find, fix, and finish individuals in locations where they thought that they were the most secure. To find somebody, locate them in space and time, go to their front front door, and depending on how they behave once we cross that front door, either take them into custody or fucking kill them. And if you do that for long enough, the last thing that you ever want to do is be around gun violence again. I don't want to, and Montana is a constitutional carry state. I carry, um, but I don't ever want to have to pull my gun out on a human being ever again. It is not, and I, I do agree with you, there are people who have this idealistic like they're going to be in like like doing a gun shoot at the okay corral it's like oh dude and I, uh, a good friend of mine uh mike glover who is actually the owner of fieldcraft survival this weekend we are doing some scenario based training where i live up in kalispell and we did one a few weeks ago and before that i had helped him out at another one and it's it's the morning starts with an introduction to pistols and then my wife teaches an introduction to jujitsu and then they do scenario based training with somebody in a red suit that may have a gun, they may not have a gun. These people have a gun on them with simunition rounds, the wax bullets that sting like a motherfucker. Varsity move is to put them in the freezer the night before. That's an aside. <laughs> That's a tip for anybody out there who still trains with sim rounds. Put them in the freezer. You'll drop them like a sniper shot to the chest. The number of people who that was their first time ever actually making a decision, should I pull this gun out and should I use it? And the number of people that would have spent their remaining days in prison for murder is startling. What's a typical scenario? Uh, I don't want to give too much of it away, but I'll give you a broad one. You are in a parking lot um, and usually he'll pair this up with a male and a female. The female will have a bag in her hand and somebody starts approaching you pretty aggressively asking for money. Hey, and, and this is like usually coming out of a grocery store and you have uh, vehicles on each side. So a little bit of a confined environment. Somebody is coming directly at you and go. The person's loud. They're coming at you aggressively. And the beauty of the last, uh, the last time we ran this is that the role player was actually a sheriff, a local sheriff. So he could really speak to, here's what's going to happen when law enforcement shows up. <laughs> uh, go ahead and uh, show me your hands, turn around. <laughs> so he could give that. And so the person approaches, I've seen it go down now three times. Every one of those times the person gets shot. They do not have a weapon. Now, and there are plenty of times where that is completely and utterly justifiable. And I would also say in that situation, it depends on if you're a man and a woman. Um, for women, absent an incredible amount of training, and even then there is a size, strength, and weight difference that cannot be overcome. The only thing that you really can do to increase survivability is to introduce a tool into that environment that levels that playing field. Yep. So if it was just a woman... Um, and in, in some of the other scenarios, that was the case. And the result, it was interesting. They they shoot early. And sometimes they need to to survive. But in this situation, it was interesting to see people go from zero to 100. I mean, to me, like the old-fashioned Spartan kick in that particular situation, 
would have been amazing because the role player was briefed. If they do anything that is hands-on, go to the ground and the threat is over. It never got to that point. I got shot every time. Wow. It's a tough one. And you got to think about this from the perspective of most security cam footage is not going to have audio. So you have to think about this from 12 people looking at this, no audio. Not hearing this person not hearing and anything. blinding in your face and saying, give me your fucking money and I'm going to kill you and I'm a blah, blah. They don't hear any of that. Do you want to roll the dice and gamble with your life with that? Most people will go and they purchase a gun. And another thing I think that should be required is actually a safe to put the gun in. It's just those two to we me should be. have those in the UK. You, yeah, it, it should be. It's, it's, it's a tool that's designed to take life and that's okay. Let's just treat it with the appropriate amount of respect. Mm. But, you know, there's, it's people will buy a gun. They'll train with it a little bit, if at all. And they think that it's, for lack of a better term, a Harry Potter wand. They can pull it out and just boom, and it's going to solve all these problems. I think the vast majority of time, if you were to pull it out, it's going to introduce problems into your life that you're going to spend years trying to navigate your way out of if you're even successful. Yeah. It's not a magic tool. It is a tool, but it's not magic. And there's a lot of pros and cons to it. And the people that I know who are the most versed in violence, whether it's with their hands or with tools, they actually want nothing to do with it. Yeah, I remember a Jocko video where he's talking about um, what to do if somebody gets aggressive in public. And yeah, run away. Every single piece of advice <laughs> involved just leaving. He's a dangerous man. He does not. It's like. You know, we I I have been doing jujitsu now for almost five years, and I go and I wear these like cool little pajamas with my buddies, and it's like, let's not roll outside, let's go get on this padding, yep. and also like we're gonna play by the same rules, right? Like you're not gonna punch me in the face, and yeah, I'm no not gonna, biting, no headbutting. Yeah, totally. I'm not gonna grab your dick and twist it off. It's like, okay, we're like we're friends. We're trying to get better. I don't want to go roll around in a parking lot. That shit hurts. Yep. Even if I know how to handle myself, I don't actually want to touch somebody who appears to be crazy. Because I don't know if they just bathed in their own shit. You know, I don't want any part of that. Mm-hmm. Like people who know the most about violence understand how how catastrophically bad it can go. And you can also win a physical fight and a gunfight and lose in the grander scheme of things. Better to avoid at all costs. Mike sent me a – did you get the bag? Did you get the pack of his new yeah. book? How fucking cool is that thing? That little – what would you call it? Like a oh, the little, little bag? Yeah. yeah it has so the little f- visor panels. Yeah, so fucking cool. And so again, where I live, I need to have, because of the distance of, you know, to first response, I need to have the ability to at least maintain care or provide a level of care until a higher level shows up. So I have that stuff all over my vehicles. And I hope that I never use it. I don't ever want to use that stuff. And I'm not hoping that, um, like, driving around every corner, like, ah, damn it, there's no T-bone wreck here. There's no motorcyclist with his legs sticking Well, that's an interesting point. The fact, if if all that you wanted was to be able to be righteous, why are people not as excited for the potential to step in and tourniquet someone as they are for the potential to step in and shoot someone? The number of people I'll ask. Well, the number of people, they also have an unrealistic understanding. I'm not a fan of statistics because they can be highly skewed and weaponized as well. But if you look at something that you are going to carry on yourself every single day, I would recommend Band-Aids and tourniquets to people a lot more than I would guns. And I'm not saying that one is more valuable than the other, but if I personally have come upon multiple wrecks in the U.S. where I have rendered aid to people and zero gunfights. That's the stats that most people are going to live in. However, if you get into a gunfight, I hope you have a fucking gun because if not, it's not going to go your way. But you're so much more likely to be able to render aid to somebody and help their life than be in a situation where somebody's life needs to be taken. Well, that's another point that I I never really realized until I came to America, which is the externality of road rage and of getting pissed at somebody on the road. You tell me there's no road rage. Oh no, there's road there's tons of road rage okay. in Britain, but I'm just checking. But people are like it never escalates, right? Like no one's no one's fucking Swerving over in front of your car and telling you to get out of the fucking car. Pussies. Well, (laughs) but when you're here, I regularly see, uh, I never forget it, man. It was the first week that I arrived in Texas and we're pulled up at, at a junction and up next to us pulls up this massive Mexican guy, no helmet on, on, on a trike. One of those trikes, LED lights on it, music's blaring. I was like, this guy is pretty fucking cool. And he's had that big fucking tattoos all over his arms like this. <laughs> and he had a fucking handgun, just open carry on his hip. And I thought, 
he gets to go wherever he wants. Like, if he wants to go in front of us, he gets to go in front of us. If he wants to stop for a while and have a cigarette, he also gets to do that too. Yeah. That there is an undertone of mortal danger in America that I didn't notice in the U- in the UK. And now this may be because it's, it's simply an alien place to me. It's new. I haven't acclimatized or the whatever. But the homeless population is more forthcoming and more dangerous mm-hmm. by an absolute country mile. They're more shuffly. They're more skitsy. They're more like come up to you and fucking try and do stuff to you. But they'll get right up in your face. It happened, literally happened to my wife and I last night. You go on 6th Street? Uh, yeah, actually, we were close to 6th Street. <laughs> <laughs> Good guess. I'm telling you, man. It's the epicenter of the crazy here in Austin. But here's the thing. Like, my wife is fucking on it. A woman came by. She was kind of getting aggressive to people sitting next to us. The woman came up and asked us for money. I took a tone of voice with that individual that indicated you're going to get one answer from me and one answer and that's it. She continued on and like it started building. I'm like, you know what? Let's get the fuck out of here. Yeah. Almost all violent confrontations can be avoided. Yeah, situational just have, awareness. Situational awareness and just, you know, don't put yourself in a, it's like, you think something's going south? Go north. You know, get out of there. <clears throat> Do you ever cross paths with Dave Castro in the SEALs? Yeah, we were, uh, I was a BUDS instructor and he was an SQT instructor. So same two, uh, two wheels of the same training vehicle. Okay. Yeah. What, what was that like? What was working with him? Prior? Never worked with him directly. So okay. I taught basic, the basic training, basic underwater demolition slash seal, which is the six month pipeline. He taught SQT, which was seal qualification training. So think of it as initial crucible, very, very little knowledge about the actual job. SQT was, I'm not going to say a finishing school because you leave there. You have a lot of knowledge, but no experience. It's it's like an associate's degree. It's not a master's. It's not a PhD. Like it's the most dangerous point in your career, actually, as I'm sure it is in law or in medicine, where you have a lot of book knowledge and zero street smarts, you're just super you dangerous. You start to be given some tools that are- Yeah, like a machine gun, yeah. you know? <laughs> <laughs> you're The most dangerous time in my career was when I knew everything, I would have told you that, but had done nothing. And they're like, here's a gun. I'm like, this is fucking everything I thought it was going to be. <laughs> <laughs> Everything I thought it could be. <laughs> Fuck yeah. Well, you were very heavily involved in CrossFit for a very for a, a long time. I don't know if they would describe it like that. I worked for the organization for about eight years. I started off for about four years of that teaching the conceptual foundation at the seminars. So giving the lectures and the weekend seminars. And then I transitioned after a deployment in 2010 to more of uh, business uh, like sponsorships, um, I manage the charitable initiatives for a little bit. So much less consumer facing if the consumer facing is the deliverables on the weekends and much more to the business. And then uh, was the pilot for Greg for two and a half, maybe three years along those Pilots. lines. Mm-hmm. Flying? Mm-hmm. Oh, wow. Really? Yeah. He. Um, so CrossFit was founded actually super small world, like about eight blocks from the last house that I lived in before I joined the Navy. So was, I am from Santa Cruz, a super small beach town on the coast. And that's where CrossFit was started. But uh, Greg had a residence in uh, Santa Cruz. He had a residence in Arizona and a residence in San Diego. And he was just on this just diamond of death in the car. And I had got when I left the East Coast command and come to the West Coast to be a BUDS instructor, they were flirting with getting rid of actually winter hell week. They were trying to increase the throughput of the program. So they did one cycle where they didn't have a winter hell week. And I checked in. They're like, we don't actually have anything for you to do. So see you in a couple months. And I was like, oh, fuck it. I saw an airplane coming in to land on my way home. And I literally drove off the, took the exit and found where they land. I was like, this looks like fun. Like, I guess I'll get my pilot's license. Didn't do anything with it. Greg calls me one day. He's like, hey, I remember you saying you had your pilot's license. This drive is just murderous. It's like eight hours each each leg of that triangle. Um, Go get all your ratings, get current again, and uh, I'm going to get an airplane. And, and so that's what I ended up doing. Was uh, Actually, it was kind of that triangle, but a lot a lot of the times just in the air instead. But directly for Greg and directly for – I flew Dave, I don't, I don't know, countless times. What was the glory days of CrossFit like from the inside? There were times uh, – I mean, I guess my metric for that would be how many seminars they would sell and the velocity with which they would sell once they went online – I think the peak I ever saw it is they were doing five different seminars across the world at probably 50 people at the seminar at a thousand bucks a head 
when I was working for them, and it would they could you could put it online. And if you had a, a phone like a Shopify alert or whatever, it would just be like bing, 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 like the velo. It was unbelievable. It's just he could take a shit and hundreds would come out. That's what I would do. <laughs> it was it was the demand so outstripped the possible supply. It just whoosh, was everywhere. You know, then the CrossFit Games came about. Um, so it, like national TV. I, I still don't know whether or not that was a good thing or a bad thing for CrossFit because it. The, what they are doing at the games is actually a really poor representation of what the actual CrossFit programming is. And it's yeah. people don't, they're not even interested in having that conversation. They're just like, that shit looks crazy. I don't want to do that. It's like, that's CrossFit type exercises, but that's not really the programming. Yeah. But it was pretty wild. I mean, I was sitting there at the table uh, with three other people when they negotiated the first Reebok deal. The 10 year deal was worth about 150 million. And I ended up managing that with uh, a good friend of mine who was a, like, uh, he was the lawyer, not a lawyer, but he was the lawyer. Um, as like a legal backstop, but it was, it was crazy, man. I got to see fully behind the curtain, which <laughs> good and also bad. Many lessons learned. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, man. It's a, uh, which actually is how you and I ended up leaking up in the first place. Correct. Yeah. We have a, a, a mutual friend who managed to get himself into some sort of quasi litigious territory, uh, for reporting what was pretty, I think, well circulated, uh, information about a bunch of the guys behind CrossFit, yeah. uh, and within not long of, of of talking about this stuff, had been hit with a number of different uh, threats for litigation. I actually wonder if they would have followed through. You know, threatening litigation is one thing; following through on it is another. You know, libel, all of the things that you can be threatened with, they're predicated on you saying something that's not true. It's also if everything is caveated with allegedly, yeah, or a story suggests a source close to, yeah, you know, you can create a lot of degrees of freedom. I don't blame him for the decision that he made. In my experience, um, there, they, it's hard to say they because it's tough at many levels to separate CrossFit Inc. At least during the time period that I was working for them. Obviously, now he's. He has moved on. It's under new ownership. And I think they just brought in a new CEO not too long ago. It's hard for me to say where the separation was between CrossFit and Greg during the time that I was working for them. But the legal aspect, the threat of uh, legal involvement was 100% there. Mm. Yeah, I, I don't know, man. It's it's strange that there are an awful lot of stories. I It gives me the impression that a lot of the guys that ran, that were a part of CrossFit from back in the day, because it's a business that remained mostly the same from a time when the world, relationships within the office between men and women, uh, the sort of accepted tone uh, of how people in positions of power related to the people that weren't in a variety of regards changed so, so much. Yeah. You know, from 2004 to 2018, it is worlds apart. Right, you have a, a, a yeah. complete reckoning around Me Too. You have massive changes in terms of what people expect uh, as as workers, as employees, in terms of their rights, uh, social movements, the advent of social media, and the expectation of of what is and is not sort of a, a allowable behavior. And um, based on what I know, based on my bro science understanding, it seems like there should be a lot of people that ran CrossFit from back in the day, wiping sweat off their brow for how close the sword of Damocles came to fucking beheading them. NDAs are a special thing. <laughs> Some of us chose not to sign them when ah. we left. So was there an offer of yes. cash? Yep, and I told them in no uncertain terms to go fuck themselves. Can you I, say how much the cash offer was? It wasn't that much. Oh. I didn't, you know, in <laughs> not, not, not it wasn't. It was like probably like eight or ten grand. I get fucked. Well, it, you know, my relationship with money, as everybody's relationship with money, has changed over time. You know, the the best days in the U.S. military, the first and the 15th. It's like, I got paid, motherfucker. Then you get out of the military like, oh, shit. This is a different, this is a different beast. For me, very fortunately, I had been double dipping and working on the weekends, teaching the seminars, and I was able to transition from my military career to working for CrossFit. But he was paying me more working for CrossFit. Then I was making in the military. You just, you don't go, you can make good money in the military, but to, you'll be solidly middle class, right? And the amount of money that he was paying me when I got out of the military was more than I had ever made in my life. And it was, I'm glad that the experiences that I had 
occurred because it was one of the biggest lessons for me when it came to money and what it's actually worth. And, and I got to the point where I just resigned and went from, I was making $150,000 a year. That's what he was paying me to zero overnight. And totally fine. I'm so glad that I did that. It, it forced me to be more creative. It forced me to find my own path. It forced me to this place where now I'll never work for somebody else again. I'm going to work for myself. And I have figured that out. And, you know, to bring it back to the, the CrossFit world, when he offered me eight grand, or he, it did, of course, it wasn't through him. It was through the general counsel. It's like, go fuck yourself. Like, if I'm going to go from 150 to zero right now, there's no amount of money in the world that you can ever pay me that's going to prevent me from telling the truth if I want to. And I was honest. And, and he, <laughs> I did an episode dedicated to my thoughts around it. And I was very broad and my thoughts still are the same. It's not actually my story to tell because people have said to me, well, why didn't you go more into specifics? And the reason I can't go more into specifics or I'm unwilling to, I should say, is that it bumps up against other people. And I don't want to speak for other people. If they want to speak for themselves or they want to be heard, they are going to have to do that. And I can talk about the things that I saw. I can talk about the mistakes that I made. I can talk about the things that I wish I had changed or had done in the moment. And I can try to shed some light on what had happened in the hopes that other people can talk. And uh, they did a good job with NDAs. It seems that way, man. It seems that way. You know, an awful lot of stories on the internet about just what the culture was like. And I don't know. There was a. I, I got into CrossFit in 2016, 2017. Mm -hmm. uh, started dating a CrossFit chick and, and was sold from that. And then, yeah, I kind of got to see, I think, the sanitization of the anti-marketing, anti-fitness industry movement to something that some people may call selling out to mainstream. Other people may say required sanitization uh, that was needed to kind of to kind of clean it up. Um, but certainly, you know, from what I can see now, it's lost its way. I think I don't think that CrossFit has the cultural hold that it used to. The pr prevalence of things like high rocks, like high rocks, should have never got off the ground. Yeah, should have never, ever, ever got a foothold. And the problem is, as you identified earlier, that I can see with CrossFit. CrossFit tried to be three things: it tried to be a business model with affiliates, it tried to be a methodology for training, and it tried to be a sport at the highest level. And you are always going to end up bouncing up against the yep. priorities for each of those. And you saw this when Greg stepped in and started having 60-year-old people doing bent over rows with jugs of milk partway through um, COVID, which I don't disagree. It's not a bad thing. Like yep. It's supposed to be fitness for everybody, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but that wasn't what people wanted to see. And then the sport of CrossFit came up against that. And that's also not necessarily that these 60-year-old people aren't going to go into your local CrossFit box and go and do the thing there. So yeah. what is it? And I think it's very difficult to try and wrangle a beast like that. And then there was talk of an ESPN deal and then the Buttery Bros, Marsden and, and, and Hebes, they get let go and the entire media team gets let go. And then there's like, all of this stuff happens. It's a weird move. He comes in one day and fires his entire media team. And it was a full, it was, we you know, one of the tranches that they had in the organization. It's uh, a, <laughs> oh, fuck. There were some, there were some offices in that building that were barely big enough for the people in them and not nearly big enough for their egos. <laughs> there was, there was in it. And I'm sure that's true of every organization, but a lot of the decisions, if you look at it from an outside perspective, like, fuck, that's probably purely a punitive decision that we're making, not a great business decision. And you know, when CrossFit first caught on, I found it in 2005, it was, in comparison to what the rest of the strength and conditioning world was doing, it was, it, was, it was revelatory. Not that they created any new movement. I can't think of a single movement that is actually proprietary to CrossFit, but it's how it was put together. Um, the programming, there certainly was an essence of the marketing. I think he, you know there was a reason that he used, especially 2005, where it's like, what are police doing? What are military doing? Fire, like great marketing. Uh, and those and those communities did benefit from it as well. So I think that it was mutually beneficial. But if you don't evolve, I don't, you know, eventually you're going to die. And I remember in 2005, like you could not find a bumper plate in any 
24 hour fitness or an Olympic lifting platform, you know, any of those things, go into any gym anywhere now and try to find one that doesn't have a kettlebell that doesn't have some type of uh, object that you can lift. That's something other than a barbell or an Olympic lifting station. So it, it did revolutionize and change, I think a lot of the landscape of strength and conditioning, but then the company itself kind of stayed the same. And I, I, I would, I would agree with you struggled to figure out, I think what the messaging of the company was going to be. There's a, a, a number of phases that you go through. I say it's the guy that's never built a multi-million dollar business, but I've got lots of friends that have, and it seems like the naught to 1 million, the one to 10, mm. the 10 to 50, the 50 to a hundred, the hundred to sort of 200, the 200 to half a bill, the bill, the half bill to one bill, so on and so forth. And, at each stage, you need to be allowed, <clears throat> prepared to let go of the things that came along previously. And the problem is that those things gave you success in the past. Yeah. So you, if you're sufficiently neurotic or overbearing or a taskmaster or a tyrant, you're not going to be prepared to let go of them. And I have a number of friends that have got billion-dollar businesses, and what they've done is been very, very good at just getting out of the fucking way and yeah. allowing people that are way more experienced than them to come in and go, look – let me dissolve everything that you understand about this and then let me work out how we turn that into the next iteration of it. But if you're not prepared to let go of it, if you're not prepared to let go of what it was, it can never become what it's going to be. And if you start making decisions on the whim of whether or not someone wakes up hungover or grumpy one day and decides to come in and, you know, get rid of people or make comments or tweet things at inopportune times, you are going to be at the mercy of, and this is kind of the same. I learned about how the nuclear football works. Have you, do you know the way that it's like distributed between all of the different silos? No. So this is fucking fascinating. So I wanted to find out from a CIA guy who worked in nuclear, like nuclear deterrent and nuclear um, uh, armament division for a while, what was inside of the nuclear football. Inside of it, you crack this uh, sort of wax thing open and inside that is the piece of paper and the piece of paper's got the codes on and the president puts the codes in and I thought um, what happens if there is a I think it's called a moral objector something like that in each different silo and there's maybe 50 of them around the US maybe more and in each of them there's two people and these two people are the most junior people in the CIA Fuck right yes. they are so junior <laughs> it's like and they work eight hour shifts so eight, 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 that's it. That's your day sorted in pairs, right? Like in the silo? Correct. Oh. Yep. And get oh. this, get this, right? So every single hour-ish, it varies, but every single hour, an alarm goes off. Codes come through. They have to type the codes in. Both of them, both of them turn the keys, both of them press the button. Every single hour. Are you sure this story's true? Come from a guy that's part of the CIA. Hmm. Andrew Bustamante, people, a lot of people have got a problem with him, but... I don't know who that is. This story seems wild, though. So it, his argument was that um, you can have these moral objectors, the story about uh, Russia from back in uh, whenever it was that dude decided, I don't think I think, I don't think that they yeah. have sent all of these uh, rockets over and then they don't, and it, he avoids, you know, a disc close, like a insect dick away from uh, nuclear war. Um, the reason that this is stopped is because it's distributed, so... This comes in every hour. You don't know where you're firing. You don't know if it's a drill or if it's real, which means that everybody is just in the rhythm of doing it. They're conditioned to press it. And here's the other thing. Because all of them are on a network and all of them are distributed, if any one silo puts in the codes, it can fire from any of the other silos. <laughs> so if you've got just one pair out of, let's say it's 50 or 100, that say yes – that do put it in, it's go. It's gone. And you don't know where it's going, and you don't know if it's real, and you don't know if it's your silo, or if you're pressing a button that goes to another silo, and you don't know what city it's aimed at. And that just happens pretty much like within a bit of a play on the hour, every hour, and you've got to do that. I feel like we could get a better system going. You should go and redesign it. That'd be great. I feel like you and me over one cocktail on a cocktail napkin could improve this plan. I'd be I'm completely <laughs> down. If... <laughs> The Ministry of Defense, or whatever the equivalent is over here, the nuclear people. I think need it's the DOE in the U.S. Department DOE, of yeah, I knew that. Yeah. Uh, once I learned the name of the people that make it, make the decisions, they can come to me, and I'll help them make the decisions. I'm here for it. Fuck yeah, I'm in. I've heard you say that you don't consider yourself to be extraordinary. You consider yourself to be extremely ordinary. Correct. I, think I actually heard you say. Yeah. 
How is it then that you've managed to achieve some extraordinary things? Uh, you know, I think probably the most exceptional thing that I've ever done in my life was graduating SEAL training. It's the odds are not in your favor. Um, and at the same, and in the same breath that I will say that I think it's an exceptional thing, it's not that big of a deal, which is obviously a statement that is opposed to the one that I previously made. The SEAL community is a community of extremely ordinary people. They are the most ordinary run of the mill could find them at any street corner in any city in any state in the country. They are asked to do occasionally very exceptional things. Um, seal the stats on seal training, you know, about 75% of people who attempt it don't make it through. Um, so I would say that that's probably something that would be considered exceptional, but the only thing that I did to graduate that was to just keep showing up. I mean, there's physical standards. Don't get me wrong. Like you have to physically be able to do running, swimming, pull-ups, push-ups, all of the requirements. I um, mean, you take some tests and training, like there's a diving test, a dive physics test, um, explosive calculations tests, all of those things that would be associated with that. The barrier to entry is not high. You actually have to try to trip and fall. Um, but I kept showing up. I literally, I just kept showing up. Um, and everything else that I've done in my life has been to a degree, if you look at it, what I'm doing right now, I, what I, what I'm very passionate about and I enjoy doing, especially because my, uh, the fact my wife participates in it is jujitsu. How do you get a black belt in jujitsu? I don't have a fucking clue, but I'm pretty sure if you just keep showing up and you pay attention and you do what the people are teaching you, if you extrapolate that out over enough period of time, you're going to eventually one day have a black belt tied around your waist and people are going to say that's exceptional. And I think that it is. But you didn't just arrive at that. Um, I enjoy skydiving. Not hard. You can make some really visually appealing videos and images, and you can make things appear to be more difficult than they can be, but it's just gravity. If you get out of an airplane, I'm here to tell you after 8,500 jumps, gravity is going to work. 8,500 jumps. It's not that many. Trust me. People who work in the sport who've been jumping for as long as I have had, have been would have – 25,000, 30,000, 35,000, like true professionals who work in the sport. I mean, I've been skydiving for 24 years at this point, but it's like, if you don't pull your parachute, you're going to die. If you pull your parachute, you're probably going to get the chance to do it again. Flying an airplane, um, kind of the same thing. Like when you first go and you learn, you have to like, there's a knowledge base required and a practical skill and you incrementally continue to go and learn more. And it's just... It's not, there is, there is nothing exceptional about me. I graduated high school with about a 1.8 GPA. I played sports in high school at what I would call, and I think everybody else would call a mediocre level. <laughs> I was on the team, wasn't really making the highlight reel. Fiercely mild. <laughs> Fierce, just competitively average. Just, fucking <laughs> <laughs> just deeply competitively average. I'm not going to win any aptitude test. I'm certainly not going to win any physical test. I think the only skill that I probably refined over time was just, I'm not, it's hard to get me to quit. I just keep showing up unless I realize what I'm doing is utterly meaningless. And then I'll shit can that thing immediately. Uh, but that's, I mean, that's really it. It's, I'm not exceptional. Anything that I have done is achievable for people, whether or not they want to apply themselves in the same way. That's the variable. That's it. Yeah. There's a, a quote from James Clear where he says, uh, consistency won't guarantee success, but if you're not consistent, I guarantee that you won't be successful. I mean, for the 75% of people who don't make it through buds, they chose not to show up one day. They made a choice that terminated that. And the people that graduated, they showed up the next day and it was really hard. It's a hard training program and you learn how to deal with that. And then you show up the next day and the next day and the next day. I watched a documentary about the Backyard Ultra race. Have you seen this? I have watched. Is that the one, the crazy-ass, like, long 24-hour one? Yes. Okay. Well, it goes, the one that I watched finished after it was approaching 36 hours. I think we're talking about the same thing. Four point something miles every hour on the hour. Loops, right? Correct. Yeah. The guy that created, I think it's the Barkley Marathon. um, That's the one I'm familiar with is the Barkley. Same. same, So it's the same dude. Okay. Same crazy guy. Uh, And he didn't like the fact that people won the marathon. <laughs> he wanted to create a marathon where the marathon always won. Yeah. 
And so he created this thing, and uh, there's a great documentary. It's a tiny YouTube channel, um, but if you just search uh, Backyard Ultra, I think it's in New Zealand or Australia, and it's about three weeks old. Read really great breakdown of what's going on. Uh, and this dude who it's his first ever one, he's not a pro or anything, he takes this guy to the absolute limit, and both of them are going in, they're s- stepping up to the line at the start, and they're fist bumping. But the guy, this fucking awesome little section with the dude that runs it, and he's sat on this, like, shit camping chair this crazy <laughs> savant of a, 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 a race programmer and he says most people don't quit during the race most people quit on the chair hmm. most people don't quit yeah they don't want to get back off the Quite chair precisely correct yeah yep they don't quit while they're while they're running that's the thing they well, quit because they sit down the i would say the number one time at buds where people quit is first thing in the morning they just they quit at the beginning of the day before the day even starts. It's uncommon, it's, except during Hell Week, for people to quit mid evolution. They just they get to a point where, like, you know what? I don't even want to start. I'm not even going to try. And that sucks. It. Uh, I've been around a lot of when I went back as an instructor. I spent a lot of time with the students who had given up on what they would express as their life goals. And it's you're talking with people who are in probably their lowest emotional state. That they may ever get to in their life. And uh, even in that moment, shortly after, you know, there's the, the, you ring a bell three times and you do have to fill out some paperwork, but regret, regret is the single most expressed emotion from those people, even in just the moments right after. I spoke to uh, Goggins Mm -hmm. um, a little while ago about this, and he was talking about the difference between the person who rings the bell and the person that doesn't. And he was saying that there are people that he knows who rang out of buds and decades later, it's still something that plagues on their mind. Because I've it's run been into them. Defining moment of their life. This- I've run into them. I've run into students who I was putting through training. And I, as an instructor, you see hundreds of students. So the, you, there's no way you're going to remember the people that. Uh, so I have not remembered a single one of the students that has come up to me, but I have run into them and just the I've sit, fucking in airports. Hey, instructor Stump. I'm like, hey, just so you know, you can you can actually call me Andy at this point because I've been out of the military for ten years. <laughs> and they will say, like, I wish I had this happen to me at the Denver airport. Guy pulled me aside. I was literally head down, walking, I you know, AirPods in, just cruising around. Guy tapped me on the shoulder, stopped. So you're not gonna remember me. You were working on the Hell Week shift, the shift that I quit, and I think about that every single day since that happened. I'm like, what year was that? It's like 2006. This was last year. I have a friend, Alex, and he posted something a couple of days ago that said, the heaviest things in life aren't iron and gold, but unmade decisions. And I think that the weight that people deal with when it comes to regret and rumination and what could have been. But when you, you know, we were talking earlier on about differences in degree, not differences of kind. Mm -hmm. And what you realize is that all of the things that you choose to do in life, I like that. You know, whether you choose to hit the snooze button in the morning or not, whether you choose to eat the cookie, even though you promised yourself that you weren't going to eat the cookie. So largely those scenarios are just a value judgment about the story you tell yourself about what it meant to you. There is no objective reason about why that particular thing is any different to hitting snooze in the morning. Now, it may have caused you to go down a different sort of life path. Mm-hmm. It may have been a particular um, uh, inflection point that could have moved your life in a different direction. But all of us are failing forward on a minute-by-minute minute basis. The name of the person that you forgot, the lack of sleep that you could have done, the fact that you picked your phone up before you saw sunlight, even though you know that you shouldn't. And you know, Yeah, fucking Huberman, yeah, shut yeah, up. Yeah, yeah. Stop talking God negatively about the things Andrew. that I enjoy. Yeah, this is, this is <laughs> my life. And, you know, all of these different things, the different opportunities that we have to fail or to succeed are largely a value judgment. But it does make you realize, like, if you want to make the most of life, you need to have a degree of resilience and you need to have a degree of consistency. Because without that, you're just going to continue to regress back to the mean. You're going to regress back to the path of least resistance, which is, you know, ringing the proverbial bell yeah. on each different challenge that you come up against. I mean, it's very common saying how you do anything is how you do everything. It There is obviously such a huge difference between hitting the snooze button and, you know, ringing the bell in buds. But I, I agree with you. And I think, you know, resilience is something that can be built over time and, for the people who are successful, 
who go through SEAL training and make it out the other end of it. And again, it's not like the most difficult thing that you can do in your life. There are other, like, fuck, go climb Everest, right? Like you, it could be your thing, whatever your thing is. The first thing you have to do is decide what is important to you and what is not. And if you can put, for me, when I was a very young man, like, this is what I want to do. And I started making decisions and some of them were about, I would get up before going to high school and go run on a treadmill, literally a 24 hour fitness, because the information I could get at the time on buds, cause the fucking internet wasn't around was that you run a lot. I'm like, okay, here I go. I'm gonna go run on a treadmill. But those decisions, you build momentum when you start making those decisions and they become easier. And for me, it was a very magnetizing pull. I, and, and I don't, it's atypical for people to know what they want to do as young as I did. However, that bit me in the ass when I got out of the military because I realized I hadn't really thought much past Never about cultivated anything else. <laughs> I was like, yeah. oh wow, I've uh, focused all my energy on something that I no longer do anymore. So, but again, that was a different challenge. But the lens of my life, even in high school, was viewed through: is this going to help or hurt me on what it is that I actually want to do? Um, people, if they can, in my opinion, at least, if they can find something that they have a goal of that nature, whatever it is, it really actually does. If you can even define a goal like that to pick something that you care about enough that it's going to modify your behavior, it makes not hitting the snooze button that much easier, but it starts with what the fuck do you want to do? Define, scare the living shit out of yourself and pick a goal that you think you're going to fail at. If you can tell me, like, cause I'll ask people like, they'll say, well, you know, how, how do I find motivation? I'm like, I don't know. What are you motivated to do? Oh, I don't really know. Like, how can I possibly help you find motivation if you can't even define for me the end state? Or somebody will get, I want to lose 10 pounds. I'm like, come on. Like, clearly you're 200 overweight. Like, 10, 20 pounds? Like, no. How about you tell yourself you want to lose 200 and you scare the absolute shit out of yourself because you think you're going to fail? Now you've arrived at a goal that we can talk about. And view your lens or view the world through that lens of, is what I'm doing helping or hurting that? And that's a tough one because the snooze button's awesome. I like to hit it sometimes. I sleep my ass off. But I didn't when I was younger because all I wanted to do was be a SEAL. And you and you have to realize at some point in time that it's not the world that's going to make those choices for you and it's not the world that's going to decide whether or not you're successful or not. It's your own actions and how you talk to yourself and how you frame your goals and the actions you take upon that that are going to make the difference. And it it's not easy, but it's not exceptional either. Andy Stumpf, ladies and gentlemen, where should people go if they want to keep up to date with the stuff that you're doing? Find out all of your content. I wouldn't follow me if I were you guys. Uh, <laughs> I don't know. I'm into some weird shit. Um, uh, you can find me on social media channels. It's just my name, Andy Stumpf212. And then my podcast is called Cleared Hot, and you can find that on all the platforms. Fuck yeah. Andy, I appreciate you. Thank you. Yep. Thank you. What's happening, people? Thank you very much for tuning in. If you enjoyed that episode, then press here for a selection of the best clips from the podcast over the last few weeks. And don't forget to subscribe. Peace.